Welcome back to Domain 5 of the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And here in Section 5.4, we'll focus on security compliance. We'll start with a look at compliance reporting before we pivot to the consequences of non-compliance. We'll discuss the elements of compliance monitoring and we'll wrap with a deep dive into the considerations related to privacy. Now, I'll provide some important foundation here about the origins of privacy and how privacy is impacted by different circumstances. This is critical information for every cybersecurity pro, regardless of role. Off we go. Welcome back to the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And in this fourth installment of Domain 5, we're focused on security compliance. And here the syllabus asks us to summarize elements of effective security compliance. We'll begin with a look at internal and external compliance reporting. We'll talk about the consequences of non-compliance. We'll look at compliance monitoring concepts. And we're going to finish our session with a dive into various aspects of privacy. So let's jump right into compliance reporting. Reporting serves a couple of important functions in this case. Number one, it ensures organizations meet regulatory requirements, but it also ensures they maintain transparency with internal and external stakeholders. Internal reporting focuses on regularly informing internal stakeholders and management about the organization's compliance posture. It demonstrates transparency and it keeps leadership informed about potential compliance risks for which they, as the leaders of the organization, are ultimately accountable. Accountability they cannot transfer. And external reporting, so submitting reports to external entities like regulatory bodies or auditors as required by specific regulations to demonstrate compliance with those regulations. And for example, GDPR, PCI, and HIPAA all require either annual or on-request reporting. Moving on to the consequences of non-compliance. There's the potential for reputational damage, which can result in a loss of customer trust and a loss of revenue. And the effects of reputational damage can last for years or even decades. Sanctions. These are legal repercussions that can be harsher than fines, including restrictions on operations or even criminal charges. Contractual impacts. So failure to comply with regulations might lead to contractual breaches resulting in penalties or termination of partnerships. Fines. Failing to report a breach, for example, can result in fines that can reach into the millions of dollars and may lead to lawsuits. And loss of license. In some cases, noncompliance can lead to the revocation of a business license or a permit to operate. Moving on to compliance monitoring. Due diligence and due care involve taking reasonable steps to assess and mitigate security risks associated with vendors, systems, and data handling practices. The assessment is due diligence, and then the actions, the mitigation, would be due care. Attestation and acknowledgement. Obtaining formal confirmation from relevant parties, like employees, that they understand and will comply with security policies and procedures, such as when we have employees read and sign that they agree to our acceptable use policy. Internal and external audits, which are regular assessments conducted by internal or external auditors to evaluate the effectiveness of security controls and to identify areas for improvement. And if done right, Internal auditors reveal issues to correct before we're subjected to an external audit. A very common practice that an organization will self-audit a few weeks to a few months before they have, say, an annual external audit for a compliance scenario because they can self-identify issues and correct them before that external auditor shows up. We can use automation, SIM and SOAR tools. SOAR is really the automation arm of a SIM solution vulnerability scanners, or other automation solutions to streamline compliance monitoring activities. These can automate investigation, incident response, and reporting. Moving on to privacy, I want to start by making sure we are clear on the difference between privacy and confidentiality. Privacy 
focuses on the rights of individuals to control their personal information. It's about giving people ownership and control over their data. Confidentiality, on the other hand, ensures that data is only accessed and disclosed to authorized individuals or entities. It's about keeping data protected from unauthorized access. To state it even more simply, privacy is about people, confidentiality is about data. So digging into privacy, what is the source of our privacy rights here in the United States, for example, and beyond? So in the U.S., the basis for privacy rights is the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And also, the Stored Communication Act of 1986 extends the Fourth Amendment into the electronic realm. Now elsewhere, for example, we have in the EU the General Data Protection Regulation, Act, which is GDPR, it protects subjects in the EU, but it applies also to U.S. companies. It's considered the gold standard of data privacy laws, and it applies to every company with customers in the EU. And by every, I mean every company regardless of country. If you have customers in the EU, you will respect their privacy rights as laid out in GDPR, or you will be find, potentially sued, you will potentially be the target of a lawsuit, you will potentially be sanctioned, and the fines can be horrendously large. Security professionals are essentially responsible for protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of all the sensitive information under their care, the CIA triad. And there are a few concepts we should all be familiar with here certainly legal implications. So navigating privacy regulations that apply to the organization, considering local, regional, national, and international data protection laws. This requires constant monitoring and oversight to ensure compliance. When you're looking at data privacy laws or privacy laws in general, you'll see the data subject mentioned. This speaks to the individual to whom the personal data belongs and compliance practices should respect the rights of data subjects, such as the right to access, rectify, or erase their data. The laws will vary. We'll talk about some influences on law here in just a moment. And you want to know the difference between the controller versus the processor. We talked about this earlier in Domain 5 when we were discussing data roles. So distinguishing between that data controller who determines purpose and means of processing data, and the data processor, who does the actual processing on behalf of the controller. Those roles get called out specifically in GDPR. If you'd like to revisit those, they're covered in Section 5.1 in greater depth. The rules around data privacy, the law really comes down to jurisdiction, meaning which country has legal authority. And different laws and regulations may apply depending on the location of the data subject, the data collector, the cloud service provider, the subcontractors processing data, company headquarters of the entities that are involved. And we can have wide ranging legal concerns. Legal concerns can prevent the utilization of a specific cloud service provider. They can add cost and time to market. They can drive changes to technical architectures required to deliver services. Because based on these laws, we might make different decisions about where we host our infrastructure and our data. But one truth that always remains, you never want to replace compliance with convenience when evaluating services, as this increases risk. And many privacy frameworks impose fines or other actions for noncompliance. And just to throw another wrinkle into it, sometimes you have laws between different countries that are conflicting, and it's up to you as the consumer providing services to customers to figure out how you make your next move to comply with those laws, which means you really need to work with your legal team. So moving on, I want to get back to those concepts around protecting confidentiality, integrity, and availability. 
So we have data ownership, which is about determining who has ultimate control and decision-making authority over specific data sets within the organization. Then there's the consideration around data inventory and retention. We need to maintain a comprehensive and accurate record of all personal data collected and processed. And it must be accompanied by data retention policies that specify how long data will be stored before secure disposal. What does secure disposal mean? It means not recoverable even through forensic techniques. And then there is the right to be forgotten. This speaks to a data subject's right to request deletion of their personal data under certain circumstances, such as those mandated by regulations like GDPR. And regulations like GDPR also come with timing, meaning limits or boundaries around how quickly an organization must respond to subject request, which means organizations must have processes and resources in place to handle those subject requests. And as an aside, it really all begins with an accurate data inventory. As a first step, organizations should develop a data inventory containing the following types of sensitive information, meaning they need to identify instances of these data types in their environment, including personally identifiable information, or PII, protected health information, PHI, financial information, intellectual property, legal information, regulated information. We actually talked about these sensitive information types in greater depth back in section 3.3 if you'd like to go back and revisit. And that does it for section 5.4. I hope you're getting value from the series. As always, if you have questions, leave them in the comments below the video or reach out directly on LinkedIn. Always happy to help where I can. I'll look forward to seeing you back here in the next day or two for section 5.5. And until next time, take care and stay safe.